Thank you again, everyone, for joining. Uh, this is the first event uh, for Yimby Neoliberal in 2021. And uh, for those of you who live in San Francisco uh, or in really any other county of, of California, the California ADEM elections are happening right now. So if you got the, the Yimby Neoliberal newsletter, you got a call to action to register. And if you did, you'll have a letter that looks like this. Oh no, my address is there. <laughs> you'll have a letter that looks like this. And what you'll do is go to the uh, yimbyaction.org slash endorsements website and vote for people to be delegates to the Democratic Party that are pro-housing. So uh, with that, thank you again to everyone joining. I'm going to hand it over to David, who is going to run the show. And I'm going to go on mute. Awesome. Away, thank David. you very much. Um, so uh, by way of introduction, I'm David Cantor. Uh, I actually joined YIMBY pretty recently, uh, and I actually studied economics as an undergraduate at the University of Chicago, uh, which is sort of notable for producing neoliberal economists. Um, and uh, actually, so one of the reasons why I brought Kevin in is a bit personal. And so a few folks had mentioned that he has a blog. Uh, and uh, one of the things that, uh, you know, sort of came up about how this blog developed when we were talking before is that it was sort of Kevin's journey into understanding what happened in the global financial crisis. And it's a very long series of blog posts, about, you know, 300 or so. Um, and to me, what was really interesting about it is I think I came in with what I would say is the current uh, kind of consensus view that, uh, you know, oh, we had this housing crash and it was because you had irresponsible lenders and too much building and, and, and um, the thing to me that was very compelling is it's a very data driven approach to this and it totally, totally changed my view. So that was great. And uh, more recently, he's uh, been at the Mercatus Center. And uh, so for those of you who are curious about the blog, uh, I would actually encourage you instead to go to the Mercatus Center where he has a series of white papers that he's done that um, are much more uh, uh, well organized and the result of uh, uh, a lot of his personal journey through that blog. And then he's also working on a couple of books. So that's sort of how, uh, uh, you know, uh, Kevin came to mind as a great speaker and, and plus it's, you know, uh, fantastically topical for uh, the, the UMB organization as a whole. So um, Kevin is a visiting fellow at the Mercatus Center uh, at George Mason University. He's currently engaged in two book projects with Mercatus on housing, finance, land use restrictions, big boo on land use restrictions, um, and monetary policy. Um, his first book, Shut Out, uh, offers a contrarian theory on the causes of the housing boom and bust. Uh, reviews of Shut Out have appeared in the Economic Record, Regulation, and the Washington Examiner. Uh, you can pick up your own copy. And I've tried to get it into my uh, friend's book club reading list, but it hasn't quite made it to the top of the vote yet, unfortunately. Um, so for those of you who are in my book club list, this is a motivation to vote for it. Um, so uh, Kevin's work has appeared in the Wall Street Journal, National Review, and Politico, and has been featured on C-SPAN. Uh, his blog is at Idiosyncratic Whisk, W-H-I-S-K. Uh, where he publishes many of his original discoveries about the housing boom and the financial crisis as he began to investigate them. Eventually that evidence accumulated to form a comprehensive new paradigm through which to view the economy and financial markets. And he now develops and communicates these lessons uh, uh, of the framework for policymakers, investors, uh, and other firms. So he has been a small business owner for 17 years and holds a master's degree in finance from the University of Arizona. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Kevin. So thank you very much for joining us and uh, take it away. Yeah, yeah, thanks, David. And thanks for everybody for letting me share my work here. Hopefully I can share my screen. All right. Um, uh, everybody can see the screen, can see my slide. All right. Um, so first I'll sort of uh, apologize, you know, as David mentioned, you know, I this, this work sort of, um, you know, is contrarian to conventional wisdom, but as several of you had mentioned, it sort of also confirms your priors, right, in a way that is hard for you to trust. So, so uh, you know, 
I, I'll probably say things that are remedial for you. I'll say other things that are uh, boring. I'll say other things that, that might be challenging or interesting. And I'll say other things that you may think are outrageous. And to be honest, I don't know for any one of you which things are going to fall into which category, and I'll probably do them all with the same amount of passion. So I apologize in advance for the for the things that aren't in the sort of um, uh, compelling category, right? <laughs> but um, before I get into the details, I want to um, go in a little bit to about um, terminology. So I'll talk a lot about closed access cities. Um, and first, when I say, you know, a lot of you that are involved in local uh, activism and politics, you're probably used to thinking of a city properly as, you know, sort of a municipal boundary. And, and just because of habit, when I say, when I talk about cities, I'm almost always talking about a metropolitan area. It's just a shorthand for a metropolitan area. And also just another sort of terminology thing, when I talk about rents, I, I'll almost always be talking about the rental value of the ha entire housing stock. I'm not talking about uh, the, the renter landlord market specifically. I'm talking about what you know, what would the what's the rent that's sort of implied on any given house, whether it's owned or uh, by the by the tenant or by a landlord. And then finally, closed access. That term uh, is a term that I started using to sort of describe um, this handful of American metropolitan areas that are just outliers that are different than any other um, metropolitan area in the country. And those are specifically Boston, New York City, San Francisco and San Jose, um, Los Angeles and San Diego. And, and so for instance, uh, on this chart, this chart shows sort of the rate, uh, you know, sort of per capita housing construction. This happens to be during the housing boom years from 2003 to 2005. And first and foremost, at its base, what makes those metro areas different than every other metro is that they um, permit housing at a much lower rate than every other metro. And so, as you can see here, during the boom, you know, even a metro like Detroit, that's dealing with a depopulation problem, was permitting new houses at a higher rate than the closed access. And then, you know, that sort of just creates a whole set of, of trends and characteristics that uh, evolve from that because these are economically powerful and successful cities. People want to move there. And so people with means move there and sort of bid up the price of the housing, right? And and so another characteristic that makes these metro areas much different than any other metro area is they constantly have this, you know, annual outflow of just tens of thousands of households every year, usually households of, of lesser means, households with lower incomes, that are forced, that are displaced from the entire metro area, you know, because they can't afford high housing costs. Um, and so, um, so that's sort of, you know, that's sort of the, the problem, you know, that one of the big problems, as you all know, that sort of um, we're dealing with in the 21st century American economy. And so before I get into the sort of the details of the, of the boom and the bust and all that, I want to talk a little bit about how that affects us ethically, right? How that affects the way we look at the world uh, that we live in, because you know we we're all sort of born into this magical time, right? This this post-industrial revolution capitalist period where where we you know escaped the Malthusian limit, uh, right? Um, so uh, you know for most of you, if you're not familiar with Malthus, the economist, he was he was born or he worked in the 19th century, and you know his you know, he basically looked at hum human economic growth sort of like you would look at, say, um, squirrel populations in the woods, right? If the, if, if the nut production in that woods is, you know, is sort of being completely eaten up by the squirrels, they, they're sort of at a population maximum, right? So that's sort of the Malthusian limit for them, right? So, so the squirrels could have lots of litters that season, but it doesn't really matter, right? They, they, they're, they're going to starve until they refine that level population that that you know can consume the amount of nuts that are available and you know the thing in addition to just having um you know this this presumption of growth that you know we're all sort of born into this society where where it's a matter of justice that we expect our children to be better off than we were right and we expect their children to be better off than they were uh, that's an an ethical intuition that's that we all sort of have it as a result of being able to live in an in economy like this. Um, 
And so in these cities, what they've really sort of done is arbitrarily created right, a, a Malthusian limit, as it were. They've sort of capped the number of people that can live in these metropolitan areas. And in addition to, you know, to the problems that it that creates just economically, it really creates sort of this ethical issue, right? Because if you're if you're at the Malthusian limit, that's a much different world than this than this great world we've lived in for a couple hundred years that has escaped it. Um, because, you know, for those squirrels, right, if you're at the Malthusian limit, uh, giving birth is an act of murder, right? If you create a new mouth to feed, um, Another mouth will have to go unfed. Um, similarly, if you know, if you if I move to San Francisco and claim a housing unit, a family somewhere in San Francisco has to give up a unit, right? Because they they sort of maxed out their capability of adding new units to accommodate my arrival. Um, so you know, it, it being able to live in a growth um, context actually sort of helps us move to really an objectively superior ethical position, right? Because we have, we have objectively better options. If you're at that Malthusian limit, if you're in a no growth context, really your only choices for the distribution of what you produce are sharing and taking, right? But if, you, if you're in a growth context, then you can grow, you can grow and share it. It's a better set of options. And so you can see sort of the difference of coming from those different um, ethical frameworks when we compare you know, NIMBY types of policy solutions versus YIMBY type policy solutions. And, and I'm sure, you know, many of you have sort of heard that sort of complaint from NIMBYs that, you know, oh, you just, you, you just think it's this econ 101 thing that you can just build more houses and that solves all your problems. And, and, and if, you know, if you're operating, if you've internalized these sort of no growth ethical norms, um, that sort of seems like, cheap, like it's like it's too easy, right? Now, of course, growth doesn't solve all our problems, but it actually does make it easier, right? It gives us more options with which to, to solve conflicts. Um, you know, so, some of the differences, you know, the a, a NIMBY proposals will tend to just be about controlling what we have and, uh, and you know, controlling the price of it and the dispensation of it and, and making sure that outsiders don't come in, right? If somebody comes in and claims a unit, uh, that's an outsider, then that, you know, that creates conflict uh, where you don't have necessarily have those conflicts if you can grow. Um, so the, you know, the difference, if you take those sort of different ethical ways of thinking about the world, um, it, uh, um, it sort of leads to a logical sort of conclusion, right, that can be very different just based on which ethical framework you're think you're operating from, right? So I'm sure you're all familiar with sort of you know people opposing, say, the Amazon headquarters, right? Because if if the Amazon headquarters moves to a closed access city, um, you know the complaint is it'll bring in a, a bunch of new workers that you know earn high wages, it'll drive up rents, it'll create dislocation for the locals, or you know people throwing rocks at the Google commuter buses, the say it's sort of the same issue. You know, these people, the people in the buses are causing disruption because they, you know, because they uh, learned a productive skill that happens to be available to them in that city, right? Or, you know, frequently politicians say, you know, blaming uh, the tech, the big tech firms, right? They made this housing crisis, you know, because they, you know, drew, on, drew in all these high paying workers to our city, right? And so if you're hearing those things from a, a pro-growth um, uh, you know, ethical framework, the, those things don't compute, right? They see, like, it seems like you can't be mad about a firm paying its workers well, right? That, that doesn't seem like something you're allowed to do. But what, what I'd like to sort of start us out with is uh, sort of thinking about three points on this issue. The first point is the people making those complaints are making honest complaints from experience um, that are sincere, that reflect the reality of living in a closed access city, that reflect the reality that has moved itself into some sort of arbitrary version of the Malthusian limit. Uh, they're not saying, you know, they're, it, in that context, the things they're saying aren't wrong, right? At the Malthusian limit, giving birth is an act of murder, right? Um, so that's the first thing I, I, I would want you to sort of keep keep in your back pocket here. The second thing I would say is those experiences that they're reflecting appear to be confirmed by empirical analysis. You could go 
to San Francisco and, and study the effect of, of some new headquarters moving to town or the effect of a new luxury condo building being built downtown. And you know, for that condo building, for instance, because you're studying it within a, a metro area that is defined by, by this limit, that's, that's a no, you know, the entire system is a no growth system. You will find, you know, say in the immediate surroundings that rents might go up a little bit or something, you can conclude that building those new units was disruptive, right? Because when you're at that limit, when you don't have growth as an option, you can't have good things. You can only have trade-offs. But, you know, if you do that same study in, in Phoenix, if Phoenix built, uh, you know, builds, um, luxury condos downtown, you're not going to tend to find those same um, results because it, Phoenix is in a growth context. And you actually really, to me, if you look at really any of the academic literature on the broader, on the housing boom and the financial crisis, which I'll be getting into, um, that's really the way all of the, you know, the literature treats the housing bubble, right? What they'll do is they'll treat housing supply as a state of nature that's different in every city. So San Francisco has a constrained supply. Dallas or Houston has, doesn't have constrained supply. Now treat that as a control variable, something we don't have power over changing. It's just the state of nature that you have to control for in every city. And then they'll study you know, low interest rates or loose lending or income growth or whatever it is they're looking at to see, to quantify how those things affected the housing bubble, right? And what they'll find is, you know, on average, all those things made bad things happen. They all created disruption and volatility in housing markets. And they especially created volatility where housing was constrained, right? So it, look, it feels and looks like they're making an empirical quantitative study. But really all they're doing is, um, you know, looking at it from a, a growth, you know, in a growth context or a no growth context. And so, you know, in Texas, there wasn't a housing boom there wasn't, you know, prices didn't go uh, through the roof. Um, there wasn't a foreclosure crisis because if you can grow, you can have good things, right? It's in places that can't grow that all good things turn into bad things. And so, you know, the average of those experiences looks bad and it looks like you can quant quantify it, but they're really, all, really all those studies are doing is just saying, yeah, if you can't grow, then good things turn into bad things. You can't have good things. Um, and so, uh, so really, there's three points there, right? You um, that these these responses to things like being angry at the tech firms for creating housing crisis in San Francisco that comes from true experience. It feels like it's empirically confirmed, but really, it's just about which sort of ethical framework are we are we going to uh, intuit from, or are, are we going to demand? Do we demand or try to accomplish growth in spite of that, or do we accept that growth is impossible or uh, in which case there are only trade-offs, right? So, so sort of keep those things in your back pocket and I'll return to those as we think about the, um, the, the housing bubble and the crisis. Um, so uh, the first thing I wanna, well, the main thing I wanna talk about on the, on the housing bubble and the crisis is, is rents. And um, this is sort of the pivotal issue that I think uh, can help us sort of just, uh, Get a grasp on exactly what was happening and exactly where errors were uh, were made in analysis in real time. So there's thousands of books and and, and articles and all sorts of th uh, writings on on the housing boom and the financial crisis, and they all sort of tick the same boxes. Um, but I think this one paragraph from the uh, Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission report may be the most important paragraph. Now that this is the big giant commission that the federal government put together to sort of get to the bottom of what caused the financial crisis, right? And in this paragraph, they, you know, they looked at the data and they, and they, you know, they knew that they had to address this. If, if prices were just going up because rents were going up, then we don't really have, there's nothing else to talk about. That's just fundamentals, you know, uh, the rental value of your house should determine the price. Um, but when, you know, when they analyzed it as, as with all the analysis that was happening at the time, clearly prices were rising with no relation to rent, it seemed, right? Um, and so here in this paragraph that where they talk about rent, uh, the, you know, they know that there's the, the most extreme examples of these prices that were going um, through the roof that were unmoored from rental values are, they, they mentioned Los Angeles, Miami, and New York City. And in these, in these places, 
price to rent ratios were doubling or more over that decade during the housing bubble. Now, it's very reasonable to see why they would conclude that rents weren't important. Uh, and, and they, you know, they spent literally a single paragraph on the topic. They concluded rents weren't important. And then they moved on to four or five or 600 pages detailing two dozen other factors that must have been operating at, a, at an extreme level to have caused prices to be so outrageous compared to their historical norm. But I want to revisit this paragraph because what if, what if, you know, there's nothing wrong with the data they're looking at. But what if we take that paragraph and what if I restate it? What if I rephrase this a little bit? What if I said to you that I've concluded that rents were an unimportant factor in the housing bubble in, in the you know, uh, greatly increased home prices that happened after the year 2000? I've concluded that rents are an unimportant factor in housing markets. And the cities that are the most extreme examples of how unimportant rent is in, in housing markets are Los Angeles and New York City, right? That, that doesn't sound quite as straightforward as the paragraph they wrote, right? L clearly anyone that lives in New York City and Los Angeles knows immediately when you talk about their housing market that rent is a, is a big issue, right? Rent is the issue that everybody's um, uh, fighting about in those cities. And so, you know, how, how, how do we explain this? You know, it's, it's sort of strange that if rent really is an unimportant factor, that the most extreme examples of cities where rent is unimportant are the very cities where rent is at its highest and is rising the fastest in the entire country. So this took more than a paragraph. They needed to, to, to dig deeper. Um, and when you dig deeper, you really do find that rent explains everything. Um, they, you know, they, they, they got this wrong. And so, you know, so what they really should have had was a five page uh, document about how this, the, the housing market was mostly about fundamentals. And those four or 500 pages would have been an appendix, sort of here's a bunch of other factors that were involved that sort of changed the way things happened, you know, on the margins. So let's look at rents a little bit. So what, I, what I've got here, these are the major closed access metropolitan areas. And the baseline here is, um, is uh, the median uh, rent in the United States. And this is you know, sort of comparing what, what was the median rent in each of these metro areas in 1980 compared to the US median. So for instance, in New York City in 1980, the median uh, unit rented for 19% more than the median unit in the country at large. So these cities are all sort of slightly expensive at that time, but not outrageously so. Now let's follow these cities from 1980 to 2000, and not a lot happens. They're all getting a little bit more expensive over that time, not a lot. They're still sort of within the broad range of, of you know, um, cost differences that we would have seen across the 20th century. And now we're at the cusp of the housing bubble period. And so now let's look at what, rent, what happens to rents in these metro areas between 2000 and 2006. Now, not only are they becoming more like other cities, now they're actually accelerating away from normal. They're getting more different from the rest of the country instead of reverting back to the norm. Now, because this, you know, because when this happened and prices reacted to this, and there was speculation and generous, you know, and loose lending and, and, and dangerous underwriting and, and all these other things, cyclical things that were happening at the same time. Um, and because it looks like at the national level um, that you know rents were fairly stable, although really anybody looking at CP, like CPI core uh, inflation, for instance, um, it, shelter inflation since the mid '90s has been driving core CPI inflation uh, for most of the years. So, so it, it's pretty clear that just in general rents have been a problem, but they're especially a problem in these cities. Um, and but but all of the explanations of this were loaded to all on all these cyclical explanations, um, and it, this wasn't a cycle. This was a regime shift. What what was actually happening was we were shifting from a 20th century economy to a 21st century economy, and um, and the the years after the year 2000 were sort of the the point in that shift where prices started to react to this persistent change in the way our economy works. 
the 20th century was a century of convergence where telecommunications and transportation and building, building, you know, lots and lots of homes, building many homes at a much higher rate than we ever built during the so-called housing. Um, and, and mobility resulting from all that. That was making cities across the country become more alike one another. So the 20th century is a century of equality and mobility. And, and what happened is we slowly you know, devolved into this 21st century that is now characterized by immobility, by a lack of building, by cities that instead of becoming more like other cities now just keep getting more and more different from other cities, more exclusive, higher incomes you know, for the typical families that live there, higher housing costs for the families that, that live there. Uh, and so we, we've switched from a century of convergence to a century of convergence, from a century of equality and mobility to a century of inequality and immobility. And because all of the policy responses to this were, were based on um, curing a disease of high prices, um, we succeeded in, in curing that problem, but that was just a symptom. High prices were just a symptom. The disease was high rents. And we did nothing to solve that disease. And so from 2006 to 2018, this is what happens to rents in these cities. They just continue to diverge and get more and more different from the rest of the country because of a lack of building, because of this divergence and this inequality, this segregation by income and class that's set in motion by the inability, the refusal to build adequate housing. Um, so one other uh, sort of way to look at this, to just show how systematic this is, um, is to look at, to compare, oops, sorry, excellent, uh, or sorry, let me. So, so the thing is, um, uh, before, um, uh, you know, before th these are all these outlier cities that are getting different and different from the rest of the country. That never happened in the 20th century. So in the 20th century, all the cities are just down here in the muddy middle, right? But once we start, entered this century of divergence, now you can see how this, this pattern is um, systematic across metropolitan areas. The most effective way to increase the price to rent ratio in a metropolitan area is to make rents really high. And conversely, for cities that still have um, moderate rents, it's practically impossible to get price to rent ratios to go up like that. You, you need a very specific sort of peculiar set of things to happen in order to get, you know, a, a city, uh, any of the cities in the interior of the country that have moderate rents to have price to rent ratios up above 20 times like we've seen in the closed access city. Um, so um, uh, so another, a different way to look at it, let's go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, Oops, Oops, there you go. So a different, another way to look at it. So this graph is um, the blue line here going back to 1960 is the percentage of our disposable incomes going to rent. And what you can see here, the thing is before 1980, as I said, we were building houses at a very high rate. Before 1980, it, uh, Pretty, almost every year, American households were increasing their real consumption of housing. Bigger houses, higher quality houses were increasing at a faster rate than our real incomes were then. We were building more and more houses, getting more and more house, even compared to rising incomes. And notice what happens to rents before 1980. They were low to begin with and they were declining. We were getting more and more house and paying less and less for it. And, and, and that's sort of what I find systematically across place and time. The more housing we built, the less we have to pay for it. It's, it's more than free. You actually, your total bill is less the more that you build in the aggregate. And that trend shifted around 1980. And since 1980, almost every year, American households have been increasing our real consumption of housing at a slower rate than our real incomes have been increasing. So every year we're buying less and less home uh, we're renting less and less home compared to our incomes, but we're paying more and more for them. So because we're not building as much, rents have kept taking more and more of our incomes. So the red line here, which only goes back to 1980, but it's interesting because the red line here is debt service as a, a percentage of our disposable incomes. And 
and that's mostly mortgage payments. And notice what, what we see here from 1980 to the top of the bubble, um, uh, debt services just followed along with, high, with rising rents, right? So, um, so like I said, we, we thought we had a price um, disease and, and all of our policies were about pushing those prices down when we really had a, a rent disease and price was a symptom. It's the same with debt. We thought we had a debt disease and we really had a price disease and high debts were a symptom, right? So because of all, all of our policies were about pushing down prices and pushing down debts, and most of those policies related to debts have basically been about making it hard for uh, large portions of the potential home buying public to get a mortgage. What we did is we solved the symptom, just like we did with prices, without solving the disease. So we've pushed um, uh, debt service down back to where it was in 1980, but we've mostly just done that by locking, you know, by creating a haves and have not society, uh, depending on if you can get access to mortgage funding. And if you can get access to mortgage funding, you can, you can live like a king now. You can get a 30 year mortgage at two and a half percent income and, and you're, you can build, buy a very large house and have very low mortgage expenses. If you're locked out of that market, largely by regulators today, or by the, the you know, federally managed conduits, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and the FHA, if you're locked out of the potential to do this, you're stuck up here, right? And the thing is, we since the crisis, we've been building homes at a much lower rate than we ever built by for, before by a long shot. So, so rents are maintaining this high level of our incomes, even though more drastically than ever, uh, Americans are retracting their housing consumption. So the problem is high rents, and high rents are caused by a lack of building. Um, and one thing that's keeping us from building enough now is that a bunch of entry-level home buyers that might induce a, a new affordable house can't get access to the mortgage to do that. So let's go ahead and move to the next um, next slide. Um, so. So I, I want you to think about this as sort of as, as a contagion issue. So, you know, there's this, as I said, we're sort of all born into this, um, this uh, economy where we take growth for granted in most cases. And, but there's always this, this tension because housing is a sacred thing, right? There's a sense of sanctity about our home. There's a sense of sanctity about the neighborhood we live in and the neighbors we have, and we don't like to see sacred things change, we, or especially don't we don't like to see them force changed on them. Um, and so there's this natural tension that always comes from living in this great time where we can presume growth and having this sort of little corner of our economy that we sort of, you know, we don't really like to see change. Um, and so there's that sort of nugget of motivation. And, and the way I would uh, describe a closed access city is that this, this is sort of, sort of a uh, metropolitan area where that NIMBY motivation has encompassed the entire metropolitan area. And so now the entire metropolitan area has a hard time changing or a hard time growing. Uh, and, and the next step in this process is, is a contagion that spread from those closed access cities out into what I call the contagion city. And so this starts to happen, you know, around 2004 and 2005. And the way that that, that, that contagion happened, the way that these problems of living in a no growth context created stresses is that they created this mass migration event out of the closed access cities. So, you know, there's always, every year there's this segregation by income and class that we've made happen because these cities don't build enough housing. And that accelerated greatly during the housing boom. So really the, the, the housing boom was basically facilitating that process. It was just accelerating the segregation that's always happening. By the peak of the housing boom, the closed access cities in real numbers were actually declining in population. And we actually, even before COVID, we were starting to see a return to that uh, a, a neutral or negative population growth in some of those cities. And the thing that makes the contagion cities different, these, you know, Florida and Nevada and Arizona, these places that seem to have bubbles, even though they're not places with persistently rising rents, uh, you know, where the places that they seem to build a lot of houses. What happened in those places is they were overwhelmed. They're the places that people from closed access cities move to, 
So they were overwhelmed by this, this mass migration of it. We basically created this housing drought in the closed access cities, and it created this housing refugee crisis that overflowed into the contagion cities. And so what happens is each of those cities, even though they tend to build a lot of housing, one by one, they hit their bureaucratic limit of how much housing they could actually put up. So you can see here on this graphic, uh, it, in the, on the West Coast, at the height of the boom, net migration out of California was causing more than 1% a year population growth in those states. That's higher than the national average population growth just from net migration out of California. So these are cities that are used to growing two or three or four percent a year, but suddenly they were even taking on more population growth, so much so that they couldn't keep up with building temporarily. So it, it, even in these cases, it's a, it's a temporary lack of adequate housing that creates their short-term bubbles. But that lack of local housing uh, in the contagion cities is coming from the lack of housing in the closed access cities that's driving all these people away. And, and sort of one, you know, there's so many ironies in the way that this all played out. And here the irony is if you're a developer, um, uh, you know, building houses in Phoenix in 2005, it's very easy to convince you that we're in the middle of a speculative fervor, right? You're building more houses than you ever have. Prices keep going up nonetheless. There's all these speculators and flippers that are now in the market because it's volatile. Uh, it doesn't take much convincing to, con to convince that person that things are out of hand and that, and that it uh, uh, collapse is imminent um, and that everything is about excess. There's too much of everything. But on the margin, the demand for housing in Phoenix then was, was coming from households from LA who were moving to Phoenix, making extreme uh, changes in their cost of living by lowering their housing costs. They're moving to Phoenix out of compromise, right? This is a, a bubble in an inferior good. For those families in 2005 in a place like Phoenix, a house there was an inferior substitute for them to the house that they would have preferred to have in Los Angeles had one existed for them. So even at the height of the bubble, you could argue that this wasn't a bubble in excess at all. It was a bubble in compromise already. It was the it was the continual sort of contagion of this no growth context that makes you know that makes good things look bad that that growth you know leads to trade offs that leads to bad things. Um, so go ahead and go to the next slide. So we can look at this in terms of population growth. So this orange line here is just a straight line to help you see trends, and um, and the this top line is the relative population of Arizona, Florida, and Nevada. And the bottom two lines are the relative populations of the closed access cities on the East Coast and the West Coast. And this gray period is basically the period where the subprime mortgage boom was happening. And you can see here what, what the subprime boom was associated with was just this acceleration of getting people out of the closed access cities. Um, the, and the orange line is just a straight line just to, sh to help see trends. So, um, it was just the, an acceleration of this long-term migration that to some extent goes back to World War II. So you can see that Arizona, Florida, and Nevada um, you know, have very high rates of growth. And then as the, as the subprime boom develops, they even bump above that long-term growth rate. And that's what ends up um, creating stresses in those places. But what really kills those places is that by 2007 or eight, population growth suddenly just dies. And so, you know, from say 2007 to 2011, suddenly they go from being overwhelmed by people to suddenly nobody's moving there at all. And that's why you end up, you know, in a city like Phoenix, you end up with uh, neighborhoods full of empty houses for sale in 2011. Now that developer uh, that we talked to in 2005, right? Or analysts or people observing these markets it's very easy to look at those empty neighborhoods in 2011 and conclude, yeah, you know, we all know there was a bubble. We overdid it. They built so many houses that we were still trying to get rid of them in 2011. And the thing is, not only is that wrong, it's implausible. In a city that's growing two or three or four percent a year, it would be impossible without a major negative demand shock, without a major economic uh, dislocation at the macro level, it would be impossible for builders to get so far ahead of that growth that they could have more than a few months of excess inventory to try to get. 
the only way you end up with empty neighborhoods in vacant neighborhoods in Phoenix in 2011 is by having a demand crisis. And so it, there's so many, it, really any sort of causal explanation that you hear uh, from the conventional wisdom about the housing boom, you really can almost confidently reverse it and be closer to the truth. And this is one of those cases. The conventional wisdom says we built too many houses um, that led to an inevitable collapse. And so then we had to deal with this crisis and all of us had to sort of slog through this long-term uh, you know, weak recovery because of all these excess houses that we had built in 2005. Um, and, and so you know, the speculators and lenders or whatever were to blame for us having these empty neighborhoods in 2011, this slow economic growth. It's really more the opposite of that. There was never anywhere that had too many homes. We created an economic crisis, and that created a demand shock that that meant that Phoenix, places like Phoenix, had a, de a depression, especially in their construction markets that lasted for years. There's actually no other way to get to that place in 2011 where you see empty neighborhoods in, in Phoenix. So go ahead and go to the next slide. Uh, so I'm going to dig a little deeper into this idea of, of population growth and building rates. And what, what, I'm, what I've got here is I've gotten Los Angeles, Riverside, and Phoenix. These are you know, three metro areas that are connected by this migration process, this continual movement of people out of Los Angeles. And, um, and so I've sort of put them all together in, you know, in one aggregate. And what this graph does, if we start in 1994 at zero, and this gray line is the actual number of housing permits issued, you know, an estimate of the actual number of homes that were built. And each cumulatively, each year, I'm just adding, you know, however many housing permits were issued in these three metro areas over, you know, year after year after year that keeps going up. And then the blue line is an estimate of how many households were moving into those cities, an estimate of how many houses do you need in those cities to accommodate population growth. And then the orange line here at the bottom is just the difference between those two lines. So if the orange line is above zero, we might, we might assume that we've overbuilt, that we've gotten ahead of things. And if the orange line is below zero, then we might think that we haven't built enough houses. And the interesting thing about um, looking at it this way, and in fact, there's lots of academic literature, or there's, there's academic literature that sort of you know, views the aggregate national market this way, And you know, you can see if you look at these three metro areas together, it looks like around 2003 or four, building starts to pump up. We start to get into this building boom, and by 2007, it looks like among these three metro areas, we've got 200,000 too many houses. Builders got 200,000 units ahead of themselves, and then you you know you can see that you know at somewhere around 2007 or eight, building slows down substantially. But we had built so many extra units that it takes until 2011 or 2012 to work those units off. Um, and so this is the conventional story, right? And, and in national analysis of what's happening, um, uh, you know, you, people make this analysis and they say, oh, in 2007, yeah, we had a million or two million or three million too many homes in the country, and, we, and it took us several years to work it off. So go ahead to the next slide. And what I'm gonna do here is I'm um, separating out these three cities now to look at them separately. They're all on the same scale now um, uh, so that you can compare them. Um, and, and so each of them, I've constructed now this model for each city on, you know, individually. So for each city, there's the gray line, that's the number of houses that were, that were permitted, the blue line, that's the number of houses you would expect to need for population growth, and the orange line, that's the difference between the two. What's interesting here is the cities, the bubble cities that supposedly overbuilt have very, not very much excess building during the boom. You see both Riverside and Phoenix get hit by this migration uh, event. So population growth bumps up in both of them. And then eventually by 2007, 2008, population growth sort of levels out. Uh, and in both cases, builders, you know, react to that rise in population growth. And then, especially in Phoenix, they react very quickly to the decline in population growth after that. So, um, so there's never a significant amount of oversupply in Phoenix or Riverside. And in fact, by this measure, Phoenix has many fewer houses 
than they would have if we had continued to follow trends from the 1990s, um, which was a very moderate time of home building. But look what we see in Los Angeles. Los Angeles also had a building boom. This gray line, it does increase a bit in that 2005, six and, uh, 2003, four and five period. At the same time that they had the building in Los Angeles, they have this depopulation of it. Suddenly population growth collapses. And so by the year 2007, almost all of those supposed, you know, extra 200,000 units that we saw in these three cities in the aggregate are all supposedly located in Los Angeles. But most of those excess units aren't coming from the building boom, they're coming from depopulation. Now, it's, it's just, again, it's implausible to suggest that in 2007, Los Angeles had too many homes. None of the signs of excess housing are in place. First of all, they're shedding tens of thousands of households every year for lack of housing. Rents are still high, vacancies never increased. You know, obviously the, the, the actual rate of building was never close to sustainable for a normal population growth. So obviously there weren't 200,000 extra homes in Los Angeles. But the thing is, if you think about the analysis at the national level that says, oh, we had a million or two million or three million extra homes, they, they may not know that they're making this argument, but to make that argument, they have to be arguing that those homes were in places like LA. Because if you disaggregate by city, and I, I've got some research that'll be coming out pretty soon on this where I really go into depth the cross metropolitan areas. Um, uh, there just aren't any cities that where they actually had overbuilt housing. Um, and so what's happening in Los Angeles? So, so let's go ahead and go to the next graph. Uh, what's happening in this Los Angeles, I think actually we get a clue about that by looking um, at household size over time uh, in, in various countries. So, so the orange and the red line, uh, lines are England and the United States. The blue and the gray dots are Japan and Germany. So um, before the mid 90s, across the developed world, household size was declining pretty substantially. And the thing is, if you think about it, that's actually, in fact, over the last 80 years, that's actually a more important factor in relative housing demand in the United States than population growth. If you think about average population growth um, has been about 1% a year uh, for the past 40 or 50 years, really. And you know, if you just go from say 3.0 to 2.97 as your average household size, that's a 1% increase in the number of housing units you're going to need to accommodate that change in household size. So, so this is actually a really important element in housing demand. And, and note what happens after the mid 90s, household size in England and the US levels off. But in Japan and Germany, household size continues to decline. Now, what's the big difference between Germany and Japan and the United States and England? One big difference is Germany and Japan absolutely did not have housing bubbles. There's very little uh, increase in relative housing home prices in Germany and Japan um, during, the during the time when we had a bubble. And of course, in England, they've really, you know, prices have continued to rise. Um, so, you know, the thing is housing, uh, housing demand doesn't cause housing bubbles. A lack of supply causes housing bubbles. And in fact, I would argue this, in, this endemic lack of supply is why our household size is leveled off. So if you think back to that graph about home building and population in LA, what's happening there? What's happening in LA is that LA is just taking the smallest little moderate baby step towards trying to be Germany. You know, during that period, at the height of the housing boom, as I'd said earlier, since 1980, We've been increasing our real consumption of housing at a slower rate than our house than our incomes have been increasing. That didn't change during the so-called housing bubble. At the peak of the bubble, we were just barely getting up to sort of neutral, where the actual real, you know, the size and quality of our homes was increasing at almost the, the same rate as our real incomes were increasing. There was never an actual housing bubble. We were just taking baby steps towards neutrality, really. But because we've been uh, you know, take, taken over by this no growth, mal arbitrary Malthusian limit in, this, um, uh, uh, you know, in these important cities, um, just the slightest amount of you know, positive change of, of you know, attempts at increasing our consumption ends up being you know, creating this, these deep uh, you know, 
disruptive changes in our economy. Um, and, you know, good things end up being bad things. And so the challenge I would make to you here, and I, you, you can go ahead and go to the next uh, slide if you want to, the challenge I would propose to you here is, um, you know, one of the big critics, that one of the institutions that gets a lot of criticism, right, is the Federal Reserve, right? The Federal Reserve overstimulated the economy in 2003 and four and five, and they are responsible for a housing bubble. They, monetary policy was, was too loose and, and they made this happen. It's their fault. And, you know, uh, nominal GDP growth in those years, during those expansion years, averaged basically about 6% a year, you know, a couple percent inflation and a few percent in real growth each year. It was pr basically the most moderate, uh, you know, it was close to the to the expansion of the late 90s, but it's basically the most moderate expand, nominal economic expansion we've seen since World War II. It was not a period of nominal economic excess. And I guess what I would challenge you with uh, here, going back to those three factors we were that I mentioned at the beginning about, you know, uh, somebody blaming the tech firms for paying their workers well, and they made this housing crisis in San Francisco. And that comes from uh, you know, the actual experience of having, dealing with the stresses of living in a Malthusian context. Um, what I would submit to you is, I'm not sure that that's very much different of a statement to make than saying the Federal Reserve is to blame for this housing crisis because they, cr they created 6% nominal GDP growth. 6% nominal GDP growth is basically the utopia of monetary policy. If you could have five or six percent GDP growth every year, um, that's really the best monetary policy could do. We were actually at a Goldilocks monetary policy. It's just that our country had become increasingly enveloped by this Malthusian limit, by this arbitrary limitation on growth, so that m things that should just be benign and good, you know, that should just lead people to have you know, more consumption, bigger homes, you know, all these things that there's no reason for us to be upset about them. They all turned into bad things because this uh, NIMBY motivation had sort of encompassed the entire country. So, so it, you know, it spread to the closed access cities, it spread to, you know, the contagion cities, and eventually it spread into the minds of, of the voting members of the Federal Reserve Committee and their critics and um, mortgage um, regulators, right, and everyone else who in 2008 is trying to figure out who to blame. Um, so, you know, that reaction came, you know, it's not a false reaction. We had 6% economic growth and it was associated with a housing boom. And it appeared to be empirically confirmed, right? You can find lots of studies about how low interest rates or uh, economic growth or loose lending or whatever created these, these dislocations. Um, but it really is just coming from, you know, which framework are we deciding to, to judge this on? Are we deciding to judge this on a framework that 6% economic growth is excessive and dangerous and we should be afraid of that? Or, or, sh or should our judgment come from, you know, demand, you know, demanding that that's something we should be capable of, of doing and solving the problems that turn that into a bad thing? And the irony of ironies here and, and this is, so this is where this graph comes into play. This is a, a graph of construction employment over time, and this, this is the United States, Canada, and Australia. They're all indexed at 1991, so you can sort of see relative growth in each of these countries in construction employment over time. The, the ultimate irony here is that our disease is that we lack adequate housing. That disease created this Malthusian context that we all experienced the stresses of. We all experience these unnecessary trade-offs that we've been imposing on ourselves because we can't grow in important ways. As a result of those stresses, we all started becoming afraid of positive things, afraid of any good thing, because every good thing turns into a bad thing when you're at the Malthusian limit. And ultimately, we became afraid of building houses, right? <laughs> So in fact, if you go to a general audience today and, and, and you, you know, unabashedly uh, defend, you know, um, uh, uh, you know, having a policy, you know, let's let uh, construction, you know, let's let it go, let's let it rip and see what happens. 
you'll inevitably get backlash. You know, oh yeah, I, you know, remember the last time we tried that? That was a great idea, right? They, they, that will sound uh, that will sound as insane to them as it might sound to hear somebody that's mad about high paying jobs, right? Because they've lived this Malthusian experience and all this good stuff turned into bad stuff. And this graph is, is such a great example of it. You know, the 2007 here um, uh, is when sort of, we're still in the same place as Canada and Australia. And that's when everybody became convinced that we had this unsustainable construction boom and there was nothing we could do about it. The only thing we could do is let it collapse. And when two, more than 2 million construction jobs disappeared, and it hit the bottom here in 2010 or 11, that has been taken as the return to normalcy. So all this, you know, this extreme excess in construction employment uh, was just a mask, all this fake employment, building fake homes that, that people don't want or need and places people don't want to live. And we, and we had to rip that mask off and have this terrible uh, recession to get back to normal. Um, this, you know, this is a picture of that. And, and time after time, uh, when you, um, uh, you know, when you look at this sort of data, what, what's just amazing to me is the conventional wisdom paints a, an ex a story of extremes. It demands extreme um, confirmation. And the thing is, I can't come here today and tell you that the scale was off. I can't, I can't come and tell you a story, you know, all this stuff was slightly overstated. And maybe the the, the crisis and all this stuff, you know, didn't have to be so bad. There's literally nothing there. There's literally no city where there were too many houses built. There's literally no sign in our broad construction employment at all of any excess. Two, two million plus uh, construction workers, instead of dealing with long-term unemployment, instead of dealing with the, the frictions of trying to find work in a new sector because jobs aren't coming back in their sector. They should have just been building things in 2010. There was absolutely no reason for this contraction. Uh, so go ahead and go to the next slide. So, so again, you know, thinking about this, uh, you know, this contagion spreading and spreading and eventually just getting into the heads of, of our pol of policymakers and their critics, um, you know, my argument is that the crisis was unnecessary. It didn't solve anything, and it wasn't anything that had to happen. The crisis happened because it was popular, because we felt like, because we decided it was necessary. And this uh, this graph uh, sort of sort of gives you uh, just a quick sort of uh, bookends of what the Federal Reserve was doing and how they were reacting from the you know they they along with all of us devolved to this sort of Malthusian ethical framework where they're reacting to a to an economy where growth seems dangerous. And what I, so what this is, is a measure of housing starts as a percentage of the existing stock of homes. So this is sort of a cyclical measure of how much is housing expanding, right? So, um, so this red line is the average of all the, all the business cycles before, the four business cycles before the 1990s. And as we entered those cycles, um, you know, we tended to be, housing starts tended to be uh, issue, uh, started at about, a percent and a half or two percent of the existing housing stock. And then back then housing was very cyclical. So at the peak of a cycle, we might be at two and a half percent. And sometimes, you know, sometimes it was a little more, sometimes or a little less, sometimes it was more than that. And then and then you know the cycle would end and and housing starts would decline back under two percent. You know, the the number of housing starts amounted to less than two percent of the uh, of the um, existing stock. So notice, so the, the blue line here is the, is the peak that peaked in 1998. This, this black line here is the sort of the peak of each of these cycles. So notice in the 90s and uh, you know, leading up to the housing boom, there, there really was no cycle at all in the 90s. If you look at this in terms of housing starts as a percent of the housing stock. And really even in 2006, the peak is nothing to write home about. It doesn't compare at all to earlier cycles, either in terms of the actual rate of homes we were building, or in terms of the cyclical movement from, from trough to peak. The only thing that happened was that we had this huge contraction after 2006. So, um, so the Fed has a meeting in, this first arrow here is a very important meeting that the Fed had in August 2007. 
housing starts are all, have already dropped enough that, that in any of those previous cycles, we would want to see them recover. And in fact, at this meeting, what the Fed talks about is, the, is they, they actually analyze and say, you know what, in all these past cycles, um, housing starts were the most important thing. And, the, and one reason they were most important is because they lead everything else. So, so when these housing starts peaked and started to fall, that's always before a recession is actually starting. And, and so in these past uh, cycles, by the, time, you know, by the time we get out here to six or eight quarters past, um, you tend to see recovery. That housing starts are the first thing that recovers. And in fact, you know, presenters at this, you know, one of the presentations at this meeting says, you know, basically at this moment in time, August 2007, in all these past cycles, this is when you really want to see housing starts start to recover. And that's what would keep the recession from being deep. Every single recession that happened uh, going back to the 50s and 60s, that's what happened. Housing starts, unless there was some strange idiosyncratic event like a war or something, every single time housing starts are what leads us out of a recession. They recover early uh, in a recession. And, but, but what the Fed decided, because they had allowed themselves to be overtaken by the experience of living in this new economy, of living in this no growth economy where good things all end up creating these dislocations, they were convinced that we had built so many houses that that option wasn't available to us. So, so at that point, the Fed literally threw up their hands and decided they had no power to avoid a deep recession because we had so many homes they, could, they, they wouldn't have been able to uh, induce a recovery in housing starts anyway. Now, as you can see here, there's, a, you know, A, as I've said, in every single metropolitan area, there's no evidence of that individually. But you can see we're already deep into a contraction where we have haven't actually had a positive housing cycle since the 80s. Um, there's no reason to think that we had too many houses. But, uh, but what makes this even sort of more um, you know, incredible is that that happens in 2007, and the Fed just kept watching housing starts decline and, and you know, would talk about at their meetings, you know, boy, if housing starts can, can decline a little more, maybe we can finally sort of get on top of this. It got so far that even in 2011, which is the second arrow here, in Ben Bernanke's memoir, he says in 2011, you know what? We're responsible for creating strong nominal economic growth. That's our responsibility. And I know that growth is still lackluster. And he says in 2011, there's not much we can do about that. We're still working off the excess inventory from 2005. So, we're years into a housing depression like none we have seen since at least the Great Depression. And Bernanke was still convinced, the Federal Reserve uh, Board was still convinced that we were working off excess inventory. They should have been uh, in reducing interest rates enough in 2007 to create a recovery in housing starts. So we had the crisis because we decided we had to have the crisis. Um, and then the Federal Reserve is, is explicit about that. So go ahead and go to the next um, uh, um, slide. And so the thing is, because of all of these decisions that we made, these policy decisions we made, the results of those policy, policy decisions are just uh, um, extreme. So these are where you actually see real extreme shifts in data. And I'm not gonna go through all these, I'll just pick the middle one here as one example. Uh, uh, mortgage originations to, um, you know, the, the quantity of mortgages being uh, uh, originated to borrowers with FICO scores between 720 and 760 is down 74% compared to pre-crisis uh, rates of lending. Now, for FICO scores above 760, households that aren't constrained by credit, they're borrowing at almost twice the rate of what they were borrowing back then. So this isn't about a lack of demand. The people that don't have a problem getting a mortgage, they're borrowing at much higher rates than they ever borrowed before. And 720 to 760, that's an above average FICO score in a country where two thirds of the, of the households own their house. So we basically made it illegal more effectively for arguably the bottom half of the 
of the what had been the pre-existing home buyer market going back decades. Families that had been conv getting conventional loans and, and making the payments on them without uh, systemic problems. Um, you know, that's the, you see those sort of extreme changes in the marketplace because of the decisions we've made, uh, you know, because we've become afraid of, of, of things that should be benign and good, because the entire country has internalized this, this sort of Malthusian, um, these Malthusian stresses. So go, uh, so go ahead and go to the one last slide. Um, you know, I, th this, you know, basically leaves me with the three implications. The, you know, the first one I, I hope is the easiest, and, and I hope you see some motivation in what I presented to you here. Um, the YIMBY agenda really is the most important um, uh, policy issue uh, that we have to address in this country. Um, it really is the key to re-establishing the sort of mobility and the sort of freedom about where people can live, um, to have the sort of uh, equality and, and you know, shared abundance that we had in the 20th century. The YIMB agenda really is the agenda that we have to see succeed to have the American economy feel like a success. The second uh, implication is a little bit more difficult because, uh, what I would suggest to you is to fully embrace that agenda. We have to embrace the radical position that the, that the uh, much feared housing bubble was actually mostly a positive thing that was twisted and, and distorted so that it had all these negative outcomes. You know, mortgages that shouldn't have had to be disruptive or shouldn't have had to have terms that were so um, you know, systematically um, uh, disruptive. Home prices that shouldn't have had to be high. Most, you know, most importantly, this migration event that shouldn't have had to happen just because we were increasing our mod our housing consumption at a moderate rate. Um, we have to fully reestablish ourselves at this, um, uh, you know, superior moral moral position of saying, if we can have growth, we can have good things. That's what we should have. And the third implication, which is the most difficult, is that's a radical position to take right now. And for the most part, it, stating that position um, in and of itself is, it, you know, is going to invite ridicule, right? The entire country has experienced the stress of living in this Malthusian context. And, and to them, there are a lot of good and benign things that it just seems like it would be too dangerous to let that happen, including you know things as simple as five or six percent nominal GDP growth or two or three percent inflation. Um, anytime we get close to those things, there's lots of fretting about the next housing bubble that we're creating. So you know, I, I was a little bit afraid that the um, that the title would sort of turn some people off. That you, you know, uh, NIMBYs caused the Great Recession. That you might feel like I was sort of coming to you today to sort of polish your boots, you know, and sort of tell tales on the enemy, <laughs> right? And, and uh, I mean, I hope you see some of that, so, some of that sort of compelling, you know, I hope you see a lot of your priors um, uh, uh, boosted from, from what I've shown you. But I, I think at the end of it all, really the, the message I have to come with you to you with is yes, NIMBYs caused the great recession, uh, NIMBYs are to blame for the great recession and I have met the NIMBYs and the NIMBYs are us. And uh, the most difficult thing that we'll have to do is, is insist for ourselves and everyone else that we let growth happen and figure out the ways uh, that, that policy choices can, can let that happen without having the stresses that come from these Malthusian uh, impositions. So th that's what I have to share with you today. And, and, and I, I'm willing, you know, I'd love to hear some questions or have some conversation. Um, you know, let, let me know, as my beloved econ teacher used to say, you know, questions, comments, and obscene gestures, um, you know, let me know what you have to say. Yeah, so I, um, I think there's a couple of uh, questions that we've gotten from the audience, and we've sort of collected them together. I think a couple are actually sort of clarifications, and, and um, the, uh, oh, my screen stopped sharing. That's, oh no, your screen stopped sharing. That's the issue. Sorry, I, I turned off the screen share since we're into Q&A. Uh, 
Sorry if yeah, that was I will, I will probably want to bring, bring back some screen sharing for some of the questions. But uh, so the first question we have is. And David, uh, I, I think I can share from my screen now. So OK, perfect. So if the argument is true, right, that the uh, sort of fundamental nature of the 2007-2008 uh, crisis was caused by closed access cities and then out migration caused by a lack of building in those closed access cities. Well, here we are, we're, you know, 13 years later, we still don't have much building in these closed access cities, right? Shouldn't we expect this same phenomenon to resume and that there will be more migration mm -hmm. into uh, open access areas where we can build cities? And should we therefore expect a second housing crisis? Um, well, I mean, that, that's, that's one of the dilemmas is if we really did just let another house, you know, let a housing boom happen, these things would all naturally start to build up again. You, you know, the, the, it's not like the dislocations are, uh, you know, didn't happen. It, you know, they, they come from this, you know, inability for these cities to build. Um, so we would have to, you know, we would have to think wisely about the problems that come up, but, you know, knowing what's causing the problems is obviously an important step toward, uh, you know, dealing with them correctly when they appear. Um, I would say there's a lot of moving parts here. Um, you know, there, there's sort of, there's sort of two things. There's how expensive, you know, how much stress is there and how much expense is there to, to live in a closed access city where you're constantly, your, your housing costs keep, you know, running up and running up and pushing you toward that marginal decision of where the family that has to leave. But, you know, the other side of that is what opportunities do you have to move to other cities? And so we've sort of shut down building across the country. Uh, so since the end of the, of the crisis, really rent inflation has been sort of high everywhere. So, so one thing that's happened is just that relative choice between closed access cities and the rest of the country isn't really shifting as much anymore because we've shut down affordable mortgage um, lending so much, the affordable cities aren't building entry level housing uh, to any great degree. So, so the sort of the opportunity cost, you know, it, of staying in a closed access city is different. The other thing that happened during that period uh, that I that I didn't quite get it didn't get into the details of during the presentation is that you know there's this segregation by income and class that I talked about. But you know, I think one of the things that happened that really set off that migration surge uh, during the housing boom was because prices, you know, shot up so much in the closed access cities. It actually induced a lot of uh, households to move away from those cities that weren't moving because of um, because of uh, distress. You know, baby boomers that lived in overpriced homes that they that the mortgage had been paid off years ago. Um, there, they started leaving opportunistically, right? Because they could get such a windfall from selling their houses during that time. So, so you actually see, I mean, there, there was a, an increase in distressed moving during that time, but there's also a really large increase in, in former closed access homeowners cashing out. And, and then that actually is partly what made the bubble in places like Phoenix worse because they're now they're waltzing into Phoenix with, uh, you know, a million and a half dollars in their bank account from their from selling their house that was free and clear, and they put a bunch of that money into money market funds or whatever, and you know, and spent five hundred thousand dollars on a house in Phoenix that they only should have paid four hundred thousand for, right? So that that discretionary migration was actually part of what I think actually made the early bubble in in the contagion cities more bubbly. And so that that's a bubble of equity. That's why you don't really see much increase in debt uh, in the in the contagion cities until after the housing boom starts to decline, because a lot of that early bubble was actually funded by equity coming out of California. And so, just as a heads up, uh, we're going to try to get the questions organized and, and crank. We probably will not get to all of them, but uh, we're going to try to get through some of the top ones by eight thirty, and then you know if folks want to stay on. Uh, uh, they can. So one of the other questions, I think the, the, the next two are sort of uh, what I would claim are sort of clarifications of slides. And so I'm going to uh, 
pop up and actually share the slide in question if I can figure out how to do that. Uh, share screen. All right. So, um, so one of the charts you have, which I'm hopefully showing and, and, and you can see is the trend lines in uh, uh, gross housing value uh, added over personal income. Right, and we have this 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 interesting trend, and you and, and and right, and you can see that from 1960 to 1980, there's kind of a decline from about 11 ish uh, uh, percent to uh, uh, you know kind of 10, and then in 1980 it starts going up, right, and you have a different trend line. And so one of the questions is, do we know what the shift was in 1980 that caused that trend to sort of reverse and then start increasing? the the gross housing value add with uh mm -hmm. as a percentage of disposable personal income uh no i i don't and of all the sort of um data that i've showed you today this is sort of um you know uh, i haven't done an in-depth analysis of uh, of what's going on here other than to just notice that this long-term trend exists um but it, but you know i i i think it's it's been pretty well established that um, that you know the sort of zoning uh, issues that that you know have have sort of put a stranglehold on these cities were starting to take effect during that time. And so, for instance, the housing booms in the '70s were very weighted toward multi-unit building, um, and and that's one of the odd things about the most recent period. You know, what we call the boom in the 2000s is that's really the first boom we had that was focused on single family homes. Um, and it's mostly because, you know, I think, you know, by the end of the 70s, there were, there were starting to already be limitations on the amount of, of multi-unit buildings that we could build. And, and I'm not so sure that's even that limited to the closed access cities. Even today, you know, we, uh, single family housing has, has been uh, going up at a very low rate since the, since the crisis. And it, and, and you know, you might expect that that could be made up for with multi-unit building, uh, but there really aren't any cities where multi-unit building today is actually making up for the lack of building in single family homes. And I think, you know, in the end, all cities are sort of dealing with that, uh, some level of that NIMBY, you know, anti-multi-unit um, uh, sentiment. Um, so I, I think one of the big differences is you definitely see huge spikes in multi-unit building during expansions back. Um, so one of the other questions was, where are we? So uh, if we look at uh, the cycle here, right? We had uh, uh, sort of, the, the question is, what is the triggering event for the 2007 recession? If it mm -hmm. wasn't from overbuilding or bad mortgages blowing up, mm -hmm. right? And and for for folks, and I believe this is the slide that folks were asking about, which is uh, shows this orange line here is number of months since January of two thousand and six. Correct, Kevin? Yes. Yeah. Right. So no, a number of quarter, number of quarters. Ah, uh, number of quarters. I yeah. see. Perfect. Right. So. So right, four and six, like four uh, on the x-axis corresponds to the start of 2007. Correct. Right, correct. And, and so one of the things this shows is right, that housing starts had already started to decline at starting in 2006. So mm -hmm. then the, the audience question is, well, okay, what caused everything to blow up? Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is a complicated issue and I have a book that we expect to have out this year where I go much into much more detail about the sort of the timeline and, and things that happen. Um, I mean, I think that the, sh the shortest answer I could come up with is that is the thing is if if the Fed had reacted, if the Fed at this first arrow had said, you know what, now's the time to really goose housing starts. How low do we need to get interest rates to induce a, a big um, recovery in building? We wouldn't be having this conversation today. No, nobody would have even known that something bad was about to happen, right? It would have just been a normal um, uh, small recession with a typical um, contraction in housing. 
So, you know, a lot of our perception of what happens is really the result of policy decisions that happened after 2007. And, and then there, there's stuff I didn't get into today where the Fed really messes up in late 2008. And then regulators limiting, uh, you know, access to mortgage just to sort of salt in the wound as you get into 2009, 10, and 11. Um, but, you know, it's really baby steps. You know, by, by the time that, that meeting in 2007 happened, nothing really, we, you know, maybe we could have avoided a recession altogether if we had wanted to. So, but what caused that contraction to begin with, uh, I mean, you know, sometimes housing starts to decline a little bit. And if we'd had a little decline in 2006, again, maybe nobody would have thought twice about it. Maybe we needed to, to have it go down a couple per, uh, tenths of a percent. But, but when that happened, the Fed, if you look at transcripts of Fed meetings, the Fed in late 2005 and early 2006 is saying, you know, the economy is getting a little too hot. And the important thing we need to do is make sure housing starts slow down. So, I mean, the Fed is on record as, a, a, you know, stating that they can assert themselves in the marketplace. And they asserted themselves in 2006. And that started what could have been just a sort of normal contraction. And actually, you know, when they started doing that, they actually never expected housing starts to decline much. Starting in early 2006, uh, e they actually continually were disappointed by housing starts at each meeting. Housing starts would come in below their forecast and they would move the forecast down and say, okay, this is where it's gonna bottom. And then they would move the forecast down the next meeting, okay, this is where it's gonna bottom. They never forecasted um, declining housing starts. Now, people, People criticize them for that today. Oh, you missed this thing that's happening. They shouldn't have forecast declining housing starts. We didn't need housing starts to decline. But by the time they get to that 2007 meeting, you know, the irony is as this keeps deepening and deepening, and it's because that they're retracting demand, they're pulling money out of the economy. Every meeting they come back to, they're convinced that instead of it being a sign that they'd pull back too much, that this is a sign that their critics had been correct. And oh my gosh, we did make a bubble in 2005 and this is the result of it. And now we're to blame. And you know our critics were right, there were too many houses. Um, so by the time they get to that 2007 meeting and, and things really start to collapse and they have this big, uh, you know, this meeting at Jackson Hole where they do all this analysis. After that meeting, they actually started accelerating their housing start forecasts ahead of what was happening. So for the next few months after that, they actually expected housing starts to collapse faster than they did because they had they had thrown up their, you know, if, if they were asserting themselves over the economy, they should have been forecasting in recovery um, because they have power to, to induce economic activity. So you can see in their forecast that they had decided that a recovery was, uh, was unavailable to them. Uh, so it just became a self-fulfilling prophecy, and it seems like a big deal now because of what happened in 2008 and 2009. It didn't have to be a, de a big deal even as late as late 2007. All right. So one of the other questions that is a, a clarification was, so you, you uh, had the series of two slides where we, we talked about uh, how the permits and unit construction in the, the uh, uh, collective LA Riverside and Phoenix area, right? And I think uh, a couple people got lost in terms of uh, breaking this down, right? Mm -hmm. Which is that uh, if you look at the slides, right? When you break it down, it seems to say that there's an excess of housing units in LA. Mm -hmm. Right. And but what you're saying is actually something different, correct? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, so, you know, this is what makes the conventional wisdom look like it's right, because it looks like if, if you add up all the cities around the country, you get that same story that there's too many houses. Right. Um, so this is actually more of like a proof by contradiction, as it were. Right. And what, sort of, what you're yeah, saying yeah. is that if you look at this trend line and you decompose these three cities and you accept the story, the conventional wisdom, then, you know, you have to have extra housing somewhere, right? And the data tells you very clearly that extra housing is in LA, yeah. right? But, uh, uh, you know, if you had extra housing, right, sort of I, what I took to be your point was, 
Uh, well, you know, what happens when you have a couple hundred thousand extra units? Well, okay, landlords start reducing rent, right? Yeah, yeah. Right, normal economics take effect, but that is not at all what was happening in LA, yeah, right? Yeah. In 2004, 2005, 2006, like the data does not support all of the accompaniments of excess housing, yeah. right? And so really, in some sense, your point is the trend line is the problem here. Yeah, yeah. And in fact, I think one way you could describe what was happening in the closed access cities is as we start to enter this new regime in the mid 90s, people on the closed access cities, access cities, their first response as rents really started to just persistently rise year after year after year was to contract. You know, I mean, I'm sure all of you are familiar with, you know, three bedroom houses that, you know, 10 Google employees are sharing or whatever. Right. And, you know, that was increasing. Um, every year during the 90s. And so partially this is just a release from some of that, a, a sort of a reversal of what had actually previously been, you know, sort of contracting, you know, deal, you know, piling into units to, to sort of make up for, uh, and so, you know, some of this might've been um, facilitated by some of these new loans that, uh, you know, could allow somebody that has been sharing a house with 10 other people with their $100,000 income. And now they could actually go out and do a no doc loan or whatever, and buy buy a small little condo somewhere, and and so they're expanding their consumption of housing, but uh, but it's not like they're buying a McMansion like you would get in Dallas, right? They're actually just reversing this this contraction that had been happening for the years leading up to that, right? Yeah, and and so and 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 also right. Part of the point is that that the um, Right, you had a dip in 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 uh, uh, in people in LA, right? Yeah. As well, so so that was one of the things that was well, well, and and the dip in people is if you have a cap on how many houses you have, any yep. expansion in housing consumption has to lead to the depopulation, right? Yeah. Right. So, um, all right, let me go and grab the next question out of queue. Um, so uh, this is a, a question and sort of a clarification. So one of the metrics you're using is housing starts. Mm -hmm. um, and the question is, is that actually a good metric? Does that generalize if you have an increase in uh, non-home ownership or is home ownership stable? So the, the housing starts measure I'm using is for every type of unit, including condos and apartments. Uh, right, so it's, it's a I'm universal talking. measure. Right. So, okay. so housing starts, as, as you use it, is effectively, think of that as beds. Yeah. Uh, regardless of what they're in. Sort of, yeah. And, and in fact, actually, that understates the, you know, housing, housing used to be much uh, more cyclical and, and much stronger uh, mm -hmm. growth. And, and as I showed, it's not cyclical anymore and the growth rates have been lower recently. That act, just using housing starts actually understates that because one of the things that happened between the 20th and 21st century is that regulations against modular building and manufactured housing also got really tightened up. Right. Uh, and another thing that would happen back in the 70s is, is there was a lot of uh, manufactured housing going up. Uh, and, and you sort of have to pull that data from another source. So, to, so a lot of time, you know, I was being lazy here and I didn't include it, but that's another thing. If you actually add manufactured housing to all these other types of housing, it has actually declined over time. Um, so so that, that if I had done that, that would actually show even more of a decline in long-term housing starts. And that's, that's one of the things that sort of led people um, astray is that what you would tend to see shared during the housing boom was people would show um, homes built for sale and they would show, you know, new home sales were through, you know, they doubled or something in the 2000s compared to say the 1990s or earlier. And, and, and because that showed excess and excess was the story we were all telling ourselves about what happened. That's the graph that got shared time and time again during the boom. But most of that increase in homes built for sale was just market share shift away from multi-unit, away from manufactured, away from homes built by their owners, away from homes built by contractors for individuals. And if you all those other all those other types of units were in long-term decline. Um, so so 
the partly what happened is the 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 data that people were sharing was actually biased uh, during the boom because there's just this natural bias of finding the thing that shows the success that we were all trying to discuss. And and one of the other points to make, is especially with respect to manufactured housing, right, is uh, that tends to be in absolute value some of the least expensive housing, yeah. right? And so one of the the core points that I I, I take that that Kevin is making is that in some sense regulation right bites hardest on low cost housing oh yeah right yeah. which is also the housing that someone with you know a, a bad credit rating will want so right if you are economically fleeing from san francisco sort of by definition not by definition but statistically speaking it's unlikely you're making a million dollars a year and can't, can't afford your housing right yeah. it's much more likely you're making eighty thousand dollars a year can't afford your housing and go to Phoenix instead, right? And so the restriction on lending, the restriction on low cost housing punishes those folks the most, right? You know, I mean, as, as capitalism is wont to do, those with the least get hit the hardest. Um, so uh, uh, another question that came up was, let's pretend for a moment that we didn't have uh, uh, Chairman Bernanke and, and we instead had Chairman Erdman. <laughs> right. Uh, what actions could have the, the Fed taken in 2007 mm -hmm. to, to avert the crash? Yeah, well, you know, uh, two things I would say uh, to introduce this answer is first, I'm, I might have done worse than Bernanke did, for all I know. Like, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I, I'm the first to admit I'm Monday morning quarterbacking here, right? Um, uh, but, you know, I hope that we can learn from the hindsight in, in any case. Um, the second thing is I, I wouldn't put too much, um, I, I, I mean, I, I judge the things that the Fed was doing, but I, I can't, and, and there's specifically some Fed policy, uh, some members of the board that, that I do especially sort of uh, hit pretty hard, say in the book that's coming out this year. But, you know, the Fed critics were all telling him to do, you know, to do even worse, right? It, every Fed critic was, is, is, you know, says they overstimulated, they bailed everybody out. Um, Except the thing Scott that, Sumner. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. And Scott, you know, Scott is sort of what led me into looking at these things this way. Um, so, so I don't even really necessarily blame the Fed. The Fed was dragging the, the country kicking and screaming toward better policy decisions for the most part. Uh, and, and it was making the country angry because the entire country was experiencing the stresses that come from dealing with this Malthusian context. And we were afraid of, of not having a crisis. We were afraid of continuing to have growth. But you know the, that's the thing is, is um, uh, the, the shift would have needed to be so minor, you know, in, you know, say stop raising interest rates in late 2005 at say four and a half percent instead of five and a half, quarter percent. I mean, that may have been enough. Maybe nothing would have ever happened. It, you know, the earlier you go in the process, um, the easier it is and, the, and the, the less of a big deal it would be. You know, so by the time we get to 2000, late 2007, the thing is that they were at five and a quarter percent um, in August of 2007. And, and here's a good example of just how wrapped up in this upside down Malthusian um, thinking the country was. Uh, it, that meeting I talked about um, that they had in 2007, that the meeting that they had, the, the interest rate decision meeting they had in August before they had that big analysis, before that meeting, that was the last meeting where they held rates at five and a quarter percent. And I'll preface this by, Interest rates is a horrible way to talk about uh, monetary policy, but I, I have to because that's the way they talk about it. But um, uh, they held interest rates at five and a quarter percent in August, and a couple of days before that meeting, the Wall Street Journal has a, a you know an editorial page op-ed um, that demanded that they keep that they hold interest rates at five and a quarter percent, and literally demanded a financial panic. In those words, I'm not paraphrasing. The Wall Street Journal op-ed uh, basically said if the, if the uh, Federal Reserve has any character, you know, they, they won't come in riding on a horse to save us all from this. They made that they created this problem. 
And, and there's a phrase that appears in that op-ed that's something along the lines of the virtue of a panic is that it instills fear and humility in the marketplace. So, you know, don't tell me that, that this crept up on us. People were demanding this. People were angry at the Fed that they would dare avoid it. Um, so, and so, and it, so when the Fed... I was going to say, I mean, it sounds like in some sense your answer is, you know, had you, your druthers, you would have kept to a more expansionary policy mm-hmm. to looser uh, 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 monetary policy. And uh, for the sake of argument, we're not going to actually define what that means because that'll yeah. get into uh, some fairly complicated macroeconomics that will lose a lot of people. Yeah. Um, got it. Sorry, I, I interrupted you. You, you were. You, you, do you want to continue down that vein? Yeah, yeah. So, so um, you know, so the Fed did what the Wall Street Journal said they should do. They held their, they held the rate that month at five and a quarter percent, and immediately there were panics throughout the mortgage market. Um, the the Wall Street Journal got the panic they asked for, and it was at the end of that month that the that the Fed uh, had this meeting. Um, that they talked about how in all the past uh, cycles, it was housing starts that led the recovery. Um, and so over the next few months, they they reduced the rate from five and a quarter percent to two percent. But there's already panics happening in finance, you know, financial markets. So at this point, the the target interest rate's a moving target. The interest rate was what uh, the interest rate was going down faster than what they were moving their target down. And in fact, if you just think about monetary policy in terms of how much money they're printing, uh, between the August when they held rates at five and a quarter percent and April or May where they eventually got down to two percent, do you? So the way that they do that is that they print money and they buy treasury bills with it, right? It says, and that injects money into the economy. They they buy things with money that they that they um, you know that they magically make out of their magic vault, right? Do you know how many dollars they printed uh, to to move from five and a quarter to two percent interest rates? Zero, nothing. On net, they didn't buy a single asset during that period. They're just chasing the neutral rate down that's declining so fast because they're already behind the cycle. So, so again, in late two thousand five, you know, it would have been very easy just to say leave rates at four and a half percent and see what happens. By the time you get to late two thousand seven you're almost probably to a point where you just got to go to zero and hope that you can salvage. Now, they held rates at 2%. Even, even after the big Lehman debacle, they held rates for two, at 2% for a month even after that. Um, so, so, you know, during that whole period, they, they just got behind, they were behind the ball. But again, the later it goes, the worse it got, and the more they became convinced that, that, that this had to be inevitable, that this was all just evidence that they'd made a mistake in 2005. Gotcha. All right. So I think we're going to go into our last one or two questions. And I think there's there's one I want to throw in that I know is going to be contentious. And this kind of actually came up in uh, 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 San Francisco, which is and, and you touched on it by saying it's actually Malthusian, right, which is vacancy taxes. Mm. Right. And uh, 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 you said they're Malthusian. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, sort of the question is, is, is there any way that vacancy taxes could help Mm -hmm. or if they, if it's pure hurt, or if you have a preferred policy, what would Mm -hmm. it be? Yeah. I mean, I think the way I would uh, talk, talk about vacancy taxes is I, I would say that that is, that's a sort of policy choice that comes from operating from the Malthusian ethical framework that you're sort of, you know, carrots and sticks punishing you know, and rewarding, you know, dealing with this fixed amount, you know, if we have an empty unit, that must mean that somebody's going without a unit because we can't just build another unit for them, right? So it comes from that inferior ethical framework. It comes from accepting that growth is impossible. And the way I would, the way I would sort of approach that is to compare uh, the, you know, the, the idea of a vacancy tax in San Francisco to the idea of a vacancy tax in a city like Phoenix. You know, one of the things, I live in Phoenix, and one of the things, uh, you know, that's nice about living in Phoenix is that for six months a year, half of Canada comes in and lives here. 
and Canadians make wonderful neighbors and it's great to have them in town. And for half the year, those houses are empty. And it doesn't bother us at all. We just build more houses for the other people that want to live here for the rest of the year. It's not a problem at all. Vacancies aren't a, aren't a problem that, that should ca cause consternation. And in fact, if you think about, you know, so the difference is we live in a city where we can grow so we can have nice things. One of those nice things we can have is Canadians, as neighbors. They're the nicest people you would ever meet, right? And um, the last thing we would want to do is tax them for that. Like, it would be a disaster for Phoenix to tax vacancies and, and drive all those Canadians away because they dare to leave their houses empty for half a year. That's not a solution at all. And the, the difference in feeling like it's a solu solution and, and realizing that it actually is not a solution is, is you know, wh which sort of ethical framework are you able to work from? In Phoenix, we can, you know, we can have growth so we can have good things. In San Francisco, you're not growing. And so it seems like this is something that, that can like solve the problem, but it's actually not, you know, the problem you need to solve is how do we grow? Um, so I just think in general, um, it, it's, it, there's a lot of secondary effects that can end up being damaging, that can end up sort of causing people to, to, to uh, you know, build fewer new units because, because this is sort of a new cost that's imposed on them when they do build the unit. Uh, I just think it's a much better option to just um, have higher property taxes in general, you know, which of course is the opposite of what, can, uh, what California does, but just you know, relatively high and uniform property taxes is a much better re revenue generator and a much better way, it, you know, actually that itself can help reduce vacancies because it increases the gross income you need to, to get a yield off a property. And so just nat natural high property taxes uh, to me seem like a perfectly effective anti-vacancy issue. But again, in a city like Phoenix, I don't care if there's vacancies in Phoenix. There, there's parts of town that are ghost, town, ghost towns half of the year. Why do I care? It only seems like something I should care about if I have to deal with all these unnecessary stresses. Right. All right. And then I think the last question I want to ask is, um, so why would housing prices, uh, I believe I'm interpreting the question correctly here, start plummeting in 2006 if the actual underlying problem is plummeting housing starts, right? Because the, the Fed's yeah. tightening cycle was done by about August 2006. Mm -hmm. so that can't be the only and, and main answer. And I guess my intuition is perhaps it's it's a nature uh, distributional problem, but I'll I'll let you uh, uh, handle this one. Uh, well, uh, I mean there are some places. So like things happening in the locally in the closed access and contagion cities, there are some localized areas that probably that did start to see prices start to decline that early. But actually, declining housing starts. Um, predate declining prices uh, in almost every um, uh, case. Um, and, and as I said earlier, actually, uh, you know, again, sort of reversing the causality from the conventional wisdom. And the causality says prices started to collapse. That led to foreclosure crisis. That meant builders stopped building. And then, and then you know, uh, that led to the crisis. Actually, what happens first is starts started to decline eventually prices started to follow. And then really most of the defaults and foreclosures happened uh, after the defaults. And in fact, uh, starts started to decline and prices started to decline. And in fact, most of the rise in debt in places like Arizona happened after, even after prices had peaked and started to decline. You really don't even see a growth in debt in Arizona until those other things have peaked. Um, so nationally really, uh, housing starts have been declining for a good 18 months before you really see at the national, you know, a sort of a broad decline in home prices. So pr uh, prices really were a, a lagging uh, effect. Um, there was something else I was going to say about that. Um, yeah, I can't think of it now, but, but, um, but oh, oh, I know. Uh, one other aspect of this story that I think most people don't uh, really 
just haven't been exposed to is again thinking about prices declining and and like triggering these sort of short sales and foreclosures and and you know people uh, uh, giving up their homes that starts to really sort of kick into gear in late 2007 and you really don't see there's a little bit of a increase in defaults and foreclosures sort of early in 2007 it's it's still pre, you know pretty much in within normal ranges until you get to the second half of 2007 uh, and so you know in the conventional story it's you know all those defaults and foreclosures then are what leads to these neighborhoods emptying out and prices collapsing because there's no demand in these neighborhoods um, but for at least a year, really for 18 months before that, before you see any um, defaults leading to a collapse in local home demand and housing prices, the first thing you see for a long time is cancellations. So as early as early 2006, the home builders um, started to see this huge uptick in cancellations that mostly, I think, it, it initially was probably triggered by um, people in places like LA, say, moving to, to Phoenix, and their home prices had been going up by, you know, 20% a year for the last couple of years, and then they just leveled off. They weren't collapsing, and they still thought they could wait out and, like, sell their house at a higher price, and they start to see sentiment changing, and then they decide, you know what, now is not a good time to move, and a bunch of those qualified home buyers that, that uh, the, the builders in Phoenix weren't stretching to find people that wanted to buy homes. These weren't people that weren't going to be able to pay their mortgage. They start canceling their, their home orders by early 2006. So one of the interesting sort of facets of the, the timeline of what happened is well before you have all these distressed um, defaults and foreclosures happening in late 2007 and 2008, 9 and 10 and 11, well before that, you have a discretionary retraction from the market of people that never never made a single mortgage payment, never moved into the house to begin with, that said, you know what, keep the $5,000 escrow deposit or whatever. We've decided that you know by the time we move into that house, it may be worth less than what our contract was for. We don't know if we can get as much out of our house as, as we wanted to, and we're just not gonna make that move now. So the irony is those, or those early changes were discretionary shifts in the market, a change in sentiment. Right. And so all of that prefigured, you know, sort of defaults and, and all that other badness. And yeah. And that all comes at really prices start to decline and really the defaults start happening after price declines and are mostly a product of people, you know, leaving, you know, leaving the bank with the loss, basically. All right, so I think we're gonna wrap it up, folks. Um, so first of all, thank you for taking so much time and walking us through your ideas. I mean, I, I enjoyed it a lot. I hope other folks did. Certainly we've got a lot of engaged questions. Uh, so I think we're gonna stop the recording in a bit and, uh, I get, and then uh, folks can stick around, we can chat, but uh, uh, I wanna give you a, a big round of applause and, and thank you for taking the time to come in. I hope uh, you, know, you had as much fun as we did, so. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, it was great. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thanks, everybody.